Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome students. I'm Carolyn Beasley, uh, Program Director of Writing, and today we'll be talking to Professor Jason Bainbridge, who's Professor of Media at Swinburne University of Technology, and he's also the Department Chair of Media and Communications at Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Carolyn. So, um, could you tell us a little bit about um, PhDs in media? So, what sorts of PhD projects are common for media students? Well, in media, we have a vi wide variety of projects. So, we look at all aspects of media industry. We also think a lot about representations in media. So we might have people focusing on representations of law, um, representations of various professions such as doctors, police, firemen, those sorts of things. We also have people that will look at individual aspects of media too. So we have people that will focus on a particular television series, a particular film genre for example, or they might look at aspects of children's entertainment or adult entertainment as well. Okay, and um, quite often media PhDs will follow a trend of what's happening around in, in um, you know, social research or media research, I suppose. So what sorts of, um, I suppose, cutting edge issues are media students covering in their PhDs these days? Well, as you say, it's an exciting area because media is very much of what's happening in the moment. It's contemporary. It's looking at the latest advances in technology. So recently we'd see a lot of activity around social media, for example, uses of Twitter um, in journalism and uh, for recreational purposes as well. We'd look at social media media management for industries, thinking about plans of how social media could work as an advertising platform or indeed as a communication tool for, for large governmental bodies too. And we also think about that intersection of media platforms and traditional industries and institutions. So um, in the field of say social work or community endeavour, thinking about how some of those non-profit organisations can better use the tools of modern media to get their messages across too. We're also thinking about things like like uh, illegal piracy, so thinking about downloading those sorts of ideas, and also changes in entertainment culture, so uh, the big multimedia franchises we're seeing now, as well as developments in TV with new models like video on demand. So there's always something new and exciting to do in media, and that's what makes the field so interesting. Mm, and things like um, you know web, web series as well, moving into those sort of edgy areas. Absolutely, and of course locative media, which is mm -hmm. the, the big new trend. So thinking about um, apps for mobile phones, thinking about uh, geolocating as a way of communicating, as a form of advertising, um, all these sorts of things. So it's very much thinking about that intersection between different uh, media texts, whether it's a film series, a TV series, these sorts of things, and different media platforms mm. and how that works. So it's enormously broad. It is, it really is, because you're talking about the major tools of communication for society. So you're bringing in all sorts of ideas around politics, around celebrity, around the function of, of organisations and modern society so it is enormously broad. Wow so if a student's thinking about doing a PhD in media what sort of advice would you give them around choosing their project? I think the number one bit of advice I'd give is passion. A PhD is traditionally about three years so you really want something that you're passionately engaged with because a lot of things are going to happen in that three-year period and really you're thinking about a PhD as your first step in your new career, your first sort of uh, contribution to a conversation that hopefully you'll be a part of for the rest of your life. So you want something that really interests you and pursue that. That would be my, my number one piece of advice. The other thing too is to think strategically about PhDs now. That's been a big change um, in, in the academy I think, is that PhDs certainly are seen as steps in career, but not just academic careers. So if you have an interest, say, in broadcasting, or you um, are particularly passionate about a certain field or a certain um, entertainer working in that field, a PhD is a great way of opening doors. So I can think of some examples we had where students wanted to work, say, at the ABC, and um, a PhD was done around broadcast news reporting and things like mm -hmm. that, the role of the newsreader. And that's a great opportunity because, of course, as part of that PhD, they're interviewing people in the industry. They're becoming a known quantity. And that's really the way to get your foot in the door because very few people will say no to a student that mm -hmm. wants to interview them. So thinking strategically about PhDs would be another important aspect. And the third one is thinking about something that you can build on. So it's thinking about developing a piece of work that you can turn into subsequent publications or you can point to in the larger public sphere. So you might um, go on television and talk about it or you might be able to generate articles around that. So it's really thinking about those three things together, 
passion, um, strategy, and also something that you can build on for the future. Wow, fantastic advice, thank you. And I suppose often um, a project will move away from the initial idea as well. I mean, if you have any advice around that, I mean, often Let's students <laughs> yes. will, um, you know, they come in with an idea that uh, ends up being much broader than it needs to be. And as they go through the process, they'll um, follow different pathways and then come to something different to what they thought they would start with. Did I you? think that's that's very true. I mean, again, two pieces of advice around that. I think there's a temptation with a PhD, as you say, to try and say everything you've ever wanted to say on a subject. It doesn't have to be that. It's your first word on the subject. And that word may end up being a book, but it's your first contribution to that dialogue. And you're trying to, as I say, have something that you're going to build on for the rest of your career. So there is a temptation to be quite broad initially with a PhD. Mm -hmm. And part of the process of, of that journey on a PhD is actually whittling down what it is that you, you need to say, being quite pragmatic about it, and realising that you're staking your claim in a territory you're going to explore for a number of years thereafter. Hmm. And um, do you want to share some of the PhD projects that you've worked on either um, as a student yourself, yes. obviously that would have been one, <laughs> <laughs> or, um, or as a supervisor? Yes, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've sort of been across a broad range of PhDs, and we've got some on the table with us today. Um, what, uh, what I've seen, I mean, my own PhD was around representations of law in popular culture. So thinking about how those representations we see in film and television, um, online and, and in print, uh, sort of contribute to popular ideas of law. So that, that great irony that I think more of us know um, more about the uh, American system of justice than we do about the Australian because we're exposed to that through programs like Law and Order and, and film series and even comic books like Daredevil. All these sorts of things speak to that, that system. So thinking about how those popular representations shape our ideas of quite important subjects like the function of lawyers, the role of law and the relationship between law and justice. So that was my, my PhD and certainly I found it a, a very rewarding experience and something I've, I've enjoyed working on since as well in that area. Other PhDs I've, I've supervised, I say there was the one around news reading which was very interesting. So thinking about the function of the news reader, um, their role in network identification, uh, at times of great crisis where people turn, thinking about uh, gender relationships in terms of news reading, so even thinking about that uh, demarcation between male and female news readers, certainly around different aspects of news with sport and weather and things like that. That was a very interesting project. Another one was around the idea of the popular documentary, so thinking about things like March of the Penguins, uh, the work of Michael Moore, seeing if documentary could actually fulfil that role of, of sort of reporting the truth but also functioning as a popular genre for people to go to and exploring uh, what concessions had to be made to achieve that popularity, which was a, a fascinating mm. project. Wow. Mm. And then there's been others that have looked at uh, discourse. So there was one that focused on uh, political discourse in Victoria during the era of Jeff Kennett and how that sort of shaped um, Victoria for many years to come and that intersection of media reportage and um, sort of political discourse, how they work together to create a representation of a, of a premier and of course by extension a prime minister as well. So that was a very different project but was looking at that interrelationship between disciplines which we see more and more mm. because mm. media touches so much it, it brings in a lot of these these different areas. So that was a sampling of some of the PhDs. Currently I'm supervising students um, looking at indigeneity in, in Australian rules football, um, how important those Indigenous representations are to the wider um, Indigenous population. I'm looking at uh, Guardian Women Filmmakers, um, sort of an area that, that is uh, largely untouched by Western academics, uh, thinking about how their lessons of working in that structure could be applied to women filmmakers more broadly mm -hmm. as well as a sort of uh, introduction to, to Ghanaian filmmaking. And then there are some more general uh, aspects looking at superhero cinema, uh, looking at uh, theme parks and how they function as media, mm -hmm. lots of different wow. things. So it is, it's a very broad field and a very interesting one. To get one. free tickets on the ride, that's what <laughs> everyone must ask. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So a lot of these um, students that have completed these interesting projects would have gone on to uh, further work in the industry as well. And, and that's a, a potential uh, pathway for students that they should uh, you know, think clearly about before they go into a PhD or along the way. So what are some of the um, outcomes in terms of careers that 
that your PhD students or those you know of mm. have um, ended up with? Generally three. I mean, there are certainly students who go into the academy, and I'd, I'd include that with students who perhaps hadn't thought that was going to be their first option, but enjoyed the PhD so much, enjoyed that research, that analysis, that they wanted to sort of pass that on um, in, a, in a teaching environment. So they've gone on to research and teaching positions at universities. The second uh, group of students would go on to work in the industry. So, I mean, mm. often they've done quite strategic PhDs, uh, thinking about how they might work in the broadcast industry. So I've had students have gone off to do kids TV in Canada, um, work with the ABC, all these sorts of things as well, radio certainly as well. And then the third uh, group of students perhaps haven't gone into a media industry, but they've gone into another industry where they've been involved with the media. So they've used those um, examples that they, they raised in their PhD and they explored in their, in their PhD. They used the research tools that they developed across that journey and applied them in the context of an industry. So they could be social media managers, for example, working on publicity campaigns for industries that they're currently in. So three groupings of students there. Um, and, and quite a broad range of activities and certainly as I say we'd be talking national and international moves uh, mm. with some of them. Mm. Mm. Wow well that's a great kudos to you and to you know other supervisors in your department that they've gone that far. It's terrific great. you know and, and it says a lot about the PhD as a first step and, and what a strategic few years it can be. Mm, mm. Sure and of course you would have examined many PhDs and um, also of course master's thesis as well yes. so um, do you have any advice for potential candidates or I suppose what do you look for when you're examining a, a PhD in media? I think with a PhD it's an interesting process because as you write the PhD as I say it's often a three-year journey so you're breaking it down into smaller and manageable chunks. When you come to finish your PhD though, you end up with a complete book. And that means you've got to think about a through narrative of what you're talking about. So an argument that develops across the course of the PhD. And that can often be the difference between a, an okay PhD or a good PhD and a very good and exceptional PhD is that mm. through narrative, that mm. sense of an argument that's maintained across the various chapters. Mm. I think in terms of breaking down a PhD, you're looking for one that shows that they've addressed all of the material. So you're looking for a comprehensive literature review that says that they are um, acquainted with all of the major works in their field. They justify why they've made the decisions they have. Secondly, they're pointing to where they're contributing to, to a gap in knowledge. So they're actually contributing to development of this area. Um, that could be quite a minimal um, contribution to knowledge. It could be a whole new field. So if we go back to that example of, of the Ghanaian women filmmakers, that's one of the first projects that's been done on that, on that sort of mm. scale. So obviously there's a major contribution to knowledge there. If we think about something like uh, superhero cinema, there's a contribution to knowledge because it's so contemporary. We're surrounded by examples of that at the moment. And also because of the application of theory and practice, which is something slightly different to what's been done before. Thirdly, I think a good PhD is also one that points to future work. So again, it's that mm. idea of the PhD as a stepping stone, mm. of saying here's the new area I've opened up, here's room for developing it further later on. And that can be by the author or by other people working in the field. Mm, sure. And what about um, academic voice? I mean, we use this term a lot, but um, many people might not understand what that really means. So mm. is there any sort of tone that you look for um, in a PhD or do you kind of vary it, vary it according to the project? Reflective tone, um, uh, a tone of authority or a tone of inquiry and inquisitiveness? Do, do all of these things have a place or do you need to have one throughout? I think they all have a place, but I think that voice changes across the PhD. And I don't just mean across the three years, I mean across the finished document as well. So often a PhD will begin with an, with an analytical voice, um, that sort of lines of inquiry will be opened up and will end with that authoritative voice and that mm -hmm. sense that the reader is being taken on a journey and being convinced step by step so that by the time they get to the end of the PhD they really have been taken across the field, they've seen this new area and they're convinced they're in very safe hands. I mean, I think the very best PhD students, because they are so focused on an area of study um, that they've spent three years with, should be experts in their field by the end of it. They should really, 
there's often a point in that last year where they overtake their their um, mm. supervisor because they they have that detailed knowledge that the supervisor can't have because they obviously have it in another area and they have a broader knowledge across the field. And we love that moment. It's As wonderful. We do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is that passing of authority over mm. to the student. So I think that authoritative voice is ultimately the end goal of the PhD, and it's perhaps the inquisitive voice, the analytical voice, which takes us there. So I think there are different voices across the journey and different voices in the document. Mm, sure. Um, and when you're looking at a PhD from an examiner's perspective, what sort of layout requirements or organisational requirements do you expect to see? I think the, the big thing I'd say is signposting. It should, be, it should very much be taking the reader on a journey and convincing them along the way. Too often a PhD, because the student is so close to the material, will skip over important elements. They have to remember that they're taking the reader by the hand through this material, often through quite complex webs of material. So signposting is a very big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, the ideas should be complex, the way they're expressed, not as much. It should be simple mm -hmm. for the reader to follow, and that way they engage with the ideas and they engage on that deeper level. In terms of a layout, I'm a traditionalist. Um, I think a, a clear introduction, a thorough literature review at the beginning, because it, it gives that authoritative voice quite early on, mm. that you have a command of the field, you're preempting any questions from the examiner about why you haven't considered that or why you've, you've taken this path. So the, the examiner will feel more settled to go on the rest of the journey with you if you've established that up front with a literature review. And then a nice chapter by chapter breakdown. Of, of the rest of the, the, the work. Mm. So that may be theory and methodology in separate chapters if that's appropriate. It depends on the complexity of the material. Some PhDs, the subject matter is so complex that that requires more expansion. The methodology is relatively mm. simple. So it is a bit on a case-by-case -case basis, but I do think a literature review up front and up early is a good way to, to satisfy an examiner very early on, mm. settle them and then take them the rest of the way. Sure. Mm. And of course, uh, over, the, over the time that you're doing your PhD, three years or more if you're mm. part-time, your liter literature review changes and grows, particularly in media, which, I mean, you may be citing and um, reviewing a range of texts that move from TV programs from the 1950s you know, and 60s mm. to something that's um, you know, on web, web series that hasn't hit the mainstream yet. So I suppose it's very important to think about um, the breadth in your literature review and currency too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the literature review is an organic document. That's often one of the reasons why, with a lot of students, we'll begin with the literature review. Often because it's the most onerous part of a PhD, you need to cover a lot of material. It's mm. often quite complex to work through that information. Um, typically, you've come to the PhD through some sort of passion, so you're looking forward to studying the industry or the individual or the individual media text. So that can be a more pleasurable part of the PhD. Mm. Taking that step back and doing the literature review means that the student's well equipped uh, with knowing what has happened in the field already. They have a set of research tools with which to work and a set of authors with which they feel comfortable. So bringing the literature review up to a certain standard early on is really important to lay that, that firm foundation. But it's an organic document. As you mm. say, it's three years. In media, things can change very quickly. So people must be aware when they're working on a PhD that the literature review is something which is constantly evolving throughout the life of the PhD. So you bring it to a certain level and then feed more information uh, into it as you go. Sure. And I think it's important that students listen to their supervisor's advice about when to include things, uh, newer literature later in the PhD. And I'll just give an example of this, is that um, it's in previous experience in supervising I've had students that don't want to add anything mm. new because they're, they feel they're close to submitting and in, they might think they're a month away, I think they're three months away. Um, and they just, they don't want to uh, pick up and work with any new material, even though it's it's perfect for what they're mm. working with. And I, I do find that's a bit of a struggle. Or there's the other extreme where people don't want to finish exactly. the literature yes. review. So it is kind yes. of hard, isn't it, to weigh up? Yeah, it is. Know. I mean, I think that the literature review, you always run a it's going to turn into a bit of a rabbit hole mm -hmm. and people are never going to come back out of it or go down mm -hmm. a series of rabbit holes and certainly I've seen uh, students on the PhD journey, journey do that and it can be quite hard to pull them back at times. Mm -hmm. I think you need to bring it to a certain standard, then you need to move on to the rest of the PhD and just have it there. I mean, I always use the example with the students, most of them are working on laptops 
um, at this point is having a series of folders open on their laptop. One of them is marked literature review. You just keep feeding information into that as you go. But it is dangerous. You want to move past the literature review probably no more than uh, you know no more than six months being spent on it mm. and then move on to the next section because it's really the application of the literature where so much of, of the work is done in the PhD and it you run the risk that you just never get out of it as mm. you say and it's the, mm. the never-ending project then and we especially don't really want with, that yeah especially with cinema if you're doing mm. something around cinema too where things are coming out in the genre all the time exactly. that, that get a, a get a buzz attached to them and mm. it might be uh, kind of elevated to a, a, a you know a something that's being that's innovative of the moment mm. and there is this temptation to just keep moving the literature I of you on. I think that's true mm. but mm. you you have to make that decision and I mean I'm uh, again thinking of a couple of the projects we're currently working on you have to decide that this is going to be this captured moment in time mm. you might not be able to get some of the material that's currently coming out um, in terms of the cinematic representations but that's something you can write on in the future. So you can point to that at yeah. the end. So it's as about the boundary, setting the boundary of what it is you want mm. to do. Yeah, mm. and um, it's interesting too. The introduction. People often uh, want to do the, or students may want to do the introduction first. Mm. And I have heard um, in, in other videos that we've got for this um, PhD hub, people talking about supervisors talking about getting their students to do the int uh, a draft introduction first. What do you think about that? I think a draft introduction, yes, to sort of um, set out a little bit about how the PhD will, will look, obviously being aware that structure will change. But mm -hmm. I think ultimately you come back to complete the introduction at the end. Mm. Again, I'm a big fan of the introduction opening with some sort of anecdote which sets the scene. So it could be an anecdote about the industry you're looking at, the person you're looking at, the text you're looking at, and then really being a roadmap of the PhD. Now you can sort of do that rough draft at the beginning, but a PhD will change over the life of its three years. Equally in the introduction, doing it last um, kind of allows you to make sure that the introduction and conclusion match up quite well. Mm. That's really what you want. Yeah. You want the introduction to say, this is what I'm going to do, and the conclusion to say, this is what I've done, this is what could be done next. Mm. That's really the idea of them being those bookends sure. on either side of your research. But you certainly wouldn't want to spend a lot of time on the introduction in the beginning because well, you will be going back to exactly. altering it and to alter it. And often it sounds very logical for us to mm. do it that way because we've worked uh, with PhD students for a while, but for a new student, they may want to hang on until they got that introduction right and it's not about getting it right no. it's about drafting exactly and right. layering yes. all the way through I mean I think that's one of the great skills you learn uh, doing a PhD is that draft process mm. that you're never going to get everything right straight off and nor should you it's as I say it's an organic document it's going to change over time you need to bring up the introduction to a rough draft as you say I'd probably describe it as a roadmap you want to provide a roadmap of the PhD but then you'll be coming back and filling in those details later on Sure. Um, and look, we touched on this, but just um, to wrap up, are there any particular problems or challenges that face students in media doing PhDs? I think we have touched on them. Mm. I think uh, scope is the first one, and that's a common problem for all PhD students. You see a document this size and you think I can cover this, that and something else. They're always too big when the projects mm. first come in. So you want to think about your scale of your project. You want to think of it as being, you know, about the three years, six years for part time. That's how long the project should be. Um, you'd be surprised how quickly that goes. I know you being a supervisor mm. as well, we've mm. seen that, we've tried to explain mm. that to students. <laughs> you know, it can be tricky. They think three years sends a long time right. at the beginning, but it goes I'll very, do it in very, a very year. Well. Exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> I had a dollar for every time I heard that. Exactly. So I I think scope is the big problem. Um, currency is the next problem. Making the decision about where things um, should and shouldn't go uh, when you draw the line. Uh, thinking about that captured moment particularly, the, the first part of the conversation, not the definitive point. Mm. Um, and in media that's very, very difficult because things do change all mm. the time. It's Equally, I mean, we haven't really talked about it, but there are some great historical projects in media too. Mm. I mean, you know, thinking about captured moments, looking at the history of, of cameras, for example, mm. thinking about uh, the evolution of newspapers, these sorts of things. So, I mean, you know, media history, that idea of the captured moment is increasingly important. And I think that uh, students need to be aware of that with contemporary practice practice too, that the media is so fast changing, it will be a captured moment in time, one you can develop further. Mm, sure. Um, any final suggestions or thoughts on media PhDs before we wrap up? Oh, look, I think the, the important thing is it's, it's almost a boundless discipline. There is so much that's touched on by media in our world now that if you have an interest in the environment, in politics, in law, um, in any aspect of society, you're going to find media as part of it. 
And increasingly, with um, people thinking about apps, thinking about online gambling, thinking about the role of locative media, thinking about crisis reporting, disaster reporting, all these sorts of things, we're seeing new innovations all the time. So I think the important thing is to think through what media can be and to be bold, to be innovative with it. So if you have a real passion about something um, in a new area, I think this is a great way to explore it and to explore that intersection between media and other disciplines, which can be very, very rewarding projects. Sure. Wonderful. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> and uh, we hope you enjoyed that and gleaned many, many moments of wisdom. Thank you. This has been a Swinburne production.